Hey everybody. Well, I hope and pray you're all doing well here in this tough time of spring 2020 with the coronavirus going around, but we are getting close to the end of the semester. The end is in sight here. This is lecture 25 of Applied Statistics. It's our second and final lecture looking at chi-square tests. In lecture 24, we looked at chi-squared tests, first of all, for goodness of fit of discrete distributions, and then also testing independence of two categorical variables when we were doing random samples from a single population. Here we're going to look at chi-squared tests for homogeneity when we compare two separate populations from, with two independent random samples. And we'll also look at goodness of fit for continuous distributions. We're just going to get into the basics of these things, and that'll be good enough for us. Here's the lecture plan. So again, this is called a chi-square test, also known as a chi-squared test. You can say it either way. In this case, for homogeneity, we are going to have, once again, data in a two-way table. It's going to start with a two-by-two two table, in fact. We'll talk also about what to do with an R-by-C table with R rows and C columns, where each row of the table will represent data, random samples, from a population. We could just do a two-sample z-test to compare proportions. However, if we use a chi-square test, we will see that we get the same p-value and a related test statistic, and it's also going to have the advantage that we can generalize it to r by c tables. We can compare more than just two proportions. We'll also say that, well, because the proportions in the table have to add up to one, we could do the z-test based on the other proportions. You'll see what I mean when we get there. And then again, I'll mention what to do for a test for homogeneity in an R by C table, and my students in my class can just go ahead and use the technique that I mentioned. Again, it's the, it's the same mechanics as a test for independence. It's just different based on different assumptions. Another application, like I mentioned, is testing continu continuous distributions. For example, we could test whether a spreadsheet is doing a good job in generating random numbers from, say, a normal distribution Let's go ahead and use a standard normal distribution with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. We can use equals rand and equals norm env spreadsheet functions to generate the random samples, and we want to see is the spreadsheet doing a good job or not. We need to bin the data. Okay, The chi-squared test by its na very nature involves finite sums. If we are going to test a continuous distribution with a finite sum, we need to group the data into bins or classes and do counts based on those bins or classes. But that does bring up a question, how do you decide what the bins or classes should be? And the answer is not always clear. Talk about the degrees of freedom. Turns out to depend on different assumptions that you might make as far as what the degrees of freedom will be. We will just do the simplest case. Um, more complicated cases can be get, gotten into. We'll do a first attempt where the bins are fairly natural to pick, but they will have unequal probability. And then a second attempt where the bins have roughly equal probability. And finally, especially for my students, at the end, we'll talk about simulating on Mathematica with random variable, variate and distribution fit test. That won't take real long. I just want to emphasize that you can do it on Mathematica. And then we'll re-emphasize the meaning of the p-value of the test. All right, so here's our first page on the chi-square test for homogeneity. Uh, so it's an example. Um, happens to be an example that I modified from our textbook here. It says, although many jobs in the airline industry have stress, it is thought that air traffic controllers are particularly susceptible to stress-related uh, kind of maladies. To support this contention, to test it, a random sample, uh, first of all, of 500 air traffic controllers is selected and surveyed. For comparison, we're going to have a second random sample, independent from the first, or at least ideally independent, of 700 workers from other areas, non-air traffic controllers. Okay, so this is the main distinction. We're thinking about two separate random samples of two given sizes. That's the difference in the background assumptions compared to the test for independence. The data I'm going to show you below in a table, we're going to test the null hypothesis that the proportion, so we are talking proportion, so we could do z-tests, of air traffic controllers with stress-related disorders is the same as that of other workers in the industry that are not air traffic controllers. Here's the data. So this is the job category over here on the left. You either are an air traffic controller or not. You have some other job in the airline is industry. Do you have a stress disorder present, yes or no? That's the other categorical variable. 
we're thinking of each row as being a random sample of, well, size 500 for the first and size 700 for the second from two populations. These are independent random samples. Okay, So we do the sampling. We see how many people that, that are known to be air traffic controllers do have stress-related disorders. There's 120 of them out of 500. That would be 24%. And there would be 380 who don't. And from the 700 who are not air traffic controllers, 126 have stress-related disorders and 574 do not. And you can see certainly based on the sample data that the percentage, the proportion of uh, air traffic controllers who have stress-related disorders is higher than the percentage, the proportion of those in other jobs. So it seems like maybe we have uh, some evidence to reject the null hypothesis that there's no difference. Okay, But the real question is always, is it statistically significant evidence? So how do we go? We can do a z-test. Let's start by doing that. Let p11 be the proportion in that upper left corner of the table. Uh, this The subscript notation is corresponding to the same kind of subscripts you would use with a matrix. It's going to be the proportion of people with a stress disorder among all air traffic controllers. In other words, the proportion of all air traffic controllers who have a stress disorder. Don't let the language get you too confused. You're talking about those who are air traffic controllers. There's 500 in your sample. We are These are population parameters though, so we are thinking about the population when we use these symbols here. P21 is going to be the proportion of people with a stress disorder among all those who are not air traffic controllers. We have a sample from that population as well, 700 of them. We want to test the null hypothesis that P1 equals P, uh, P11 equals P21, which in the table corresponds to upper left corner and lower lower left corner, except those are sample numbers. We're talking about population proportions here, versus the alternative hypothesis that is two-tailed, that P11 does not equal P21. This can be done with the z-test. Okay, Look at the sample proportions, P11 hat and P21 hat, based on the sample data from the previous slide. Just like I mentioned, there's 24% of them. All the air traffic controllers have a stress-related disorder. And it turns out 126 out of 700 is 18% of those who are not air traffic controllers have a stress-related disorder. To do this test with proportions, you do need to do the pooled proportions because you're assuming the null hypothesis is true. You're giving it the benefit of the doubt when you do the test. So if you combine the two samples into one big sample, you can get the pooled proportion, which would be your best estimate for the common population proportion if you assume that the common population proportion is the same. It's common for both populations. 246 is 120 plus 126. 1200 is 500 plus 700. This is 0 0.205. You can see it's a bit closer to uh, 0.18 than it is to 0.24, and that's because the second group has a bigger sample size. You gotta compute the Z statistic. This is your test statistic right here. Take the difference of these sample proportions and divide by the square root of, maybe you've seen this formula before, maybe you haven't, p hat times 1 minus p hat, where p hat is the pool proportion, times in parentheses 1 over n1 plus 1 over n2, um, and that turns out to be about 2.53825, and then the two-tailed p-value would be 2 times the probability that a z-statistic is bigger than or equal to 2.54, if we do some rounding, and this probability rounds to about 1.1%, pretty small, we're going to reject the null. We've got statistically significant evidence against the null hypothesis here, so we will reject it. Okay, Most people would choose to reject it in this kind of situation. But in rejecting, we are subject to a type 1 error where we've rejected the null when it's true. So that would mean we're saying we've got evidence that they're different when they're really not, Okay, which could lead to making bad decisions, perhaps. you got to think about those kinds of things in real life. What if we had applied the chi-squared test to the previous two-way table? Okay, um, what would happen? Let's just see what would happen. I mean, it is a two-way table, just like we talked about in lecture 24. What would happen if we applied the chi-square test to it? Here's the observed table. And notice I added up the columns as well. Because recall, from lecture 24, to compute the expected table, which is the next thing we need to do, we need to do various multiplications and divisions on this table. For example, in the upper left corner of the expected table, we need to take the, um, which is up here, we need to take the number in row 1 of this table times the number in column 1, because the upper left entry is in row 1 and column 1, 
and divide by the total. So 500 times 246 divided by 1200, that'll give us the upper left number for the expected table. Likewise, for example, for the lower left number, we'd take this number, 700 times 246 divided by 1200. Got to do that four times for the four things in the main body of the table. This is a two by two table, R equals two rows and C equals two columns. Here is the expected table. You should take the time to pause the video here and double check these numbers. Okay, and I do make mistakes, so if you ever find a mistake in one of my videos, go ahead and send me a message. I try to double check things. And the, the key question is, do we have statistically significant tables here, essentially, and the chi-score statistic measures that. You know, we've got differences. The sample data always is going to be different than the expected data when you assume the null is true, but is it a statistically significant difference? What is the value of the chi-square statistic? Here it is. Remember that you do, in each fraction here, you do observed minus expected quantity squared divided by expected. So the 120 is the observed number in the upper left corner of the uh, actual table, the, based on the actual sample data. The 102.5 is in the upper left corner of the expected table. Observe minus expected quantity squared divided by expected. Do that for each one of those four spots in the table where you go back and forth between the tables here. And when you simplify this, you get about 6.443. How many degrees of freedom are there? Remember, for an R by C table with R rows and C columns in the main part of the table, don't include the totals, uh, the degrees of freedom is R minus 1 times C minus 1. This is a 2 by 2 table. R and C are both 2, so you're going to get 1 times 1 is 1 degree of freedom. And this results in a p-value that, hey, is the same thing we got before with the Z statistic, about 1.1%. And you can double check this with the calculator. I think I will do that here. I've got a calculator that I can show you here. All I need to double check what the number was, 6.443 for the chi-square statistic with one degree of freedom. So for example, with a TI calculator, I can go to my distributions menu here, go down to chi-squared, CDF, enter that, uh, 6.443 I think it was. I always forget these things as I'm doing them. One degree of freedom. So hopefully we get about 1.1%, 0.011 here. Yes, we do. Okay, so that's the way you can do it with the calculator. And now let's go back to the PowerPoint here. Is it an accident that the p-value is the same? No. Also notice, not only is the p-value same, the same, but the z statistic and the chi-square statistic are related. In fact, if you square the z statistic, you get the chi-square statistic. Weird. Okay, it's, and it's not an accident that that happened, but I'm not going to get into the reasons why. That's also not an accident. In fact, though, we could have even done the original problem using the other proportions in the other column, the second column of the table. We could have tested P12 versus, uh, equals P22 versus them not being equal, where P12 is the population proportion corresponding to the upper right corner, of the table and P22 corresponds to the population proportion for the lower right corner. What's going to happen if we do that? Well, the sample proportions are going to be 1 minus the previous sample proportions from the other page in both cases. So you're going to get 0 0.76 and 0 0.82 instead of 0 0.24 and 0 0.18. The pool proportions also going to be 1 minus the previous pool proportions proportion, the other one here. And that will result in a Z statistic that's very much related to the previous one. It's going to be the opposite of it, in fact. Negative 2.53825 instead of positive 2.53825. Well, the ordering of these things is irrelevant, so the sign of the Z statistic doesn't really matter. The p-value is going to be the same. You're still going to get about 1.1%. We're still going to reject the null hypothesis. Okay? You know, those probabilities, those proportions in each row have to add up to 1. That's why this happened in this way. What happens if we extend the chi-square test for homogeneity to an R by C table? Now we're talking about comparing more than just two proportions. It tests a very expansive null hypothesis. Essentially that the proportions in each of the sets of columns are all the same. So if j is, starts with 1, then you're talking about the first column, and you're saying p1j equals p2j equals p3j 
up through PRJ, all those proportions that you can compute um, if you were talking about the population are going to be the same. And it's also true for the next value of j when j is 2, and then when j is 3, etc. So in each column, if you had data for the entire population, so we're talking about population parameters here, not sample statistics, those population proportions would be the same in each column. Okay. Again, not, when you think about it practically, this is not a likely thing to happen. But remember the philosophy with hypothesis testing is you give the null the benefit of the, of the doubt. Okay, You don't reject it unless you've got strong evidence against it. The alternative hypothesis is that some pair proportions in the same column are not equal, which also means at least one other pair in some other column will, will not be equal as well, because all those proportions across each row have to add up to one. The computation of the expected table, the test statistic, and the p-value are the same. Do it the same as before, same as we did in lecture 24. And the degrees of freedom is r minus 1 times c minus 1. You know, if you had r was 5 and c was 4, then you'd be doing uh, 4 times 3 is 12 degrees of freedom. The calculation of the chi-square statistic is the same as before. The sum of the observed minus expected quantity squareds divided by expecteds. Okay, same as before. You can do it. All right, let's go on to the next main topic of our lecture right here today. Another application, continuous distributions. We're just getting a little peek into this. Uh, there are some problems with what I'm about to show you. It's not an ideal kind of thing. You need to tweak it in various ways to try to make it better. There are other kinds of tests out there. And in fact, I have a friend who's a professional statistician who told me that mostly graphical methods are used, especially with normal distributions. But this gives you hints at other kinds of possible things that can be done. So suppose we have an observed data about a continuous random variable, capital X. We can try at least to do a chi-square test to see whether the data we obtain are consistent with an assumed continuous distribution for x. Okay, so x takes some values in a continuum. We're assuming some background distribution, some probability density function for x, and then corresponding cumulative distribution function. If we're going to do this, though, again, the chi-square statistic is a discrete kind of thing. We need to group the data into classes or bins before we can possibly compute the chi-square statistic, before we can compute the observed and expected counts, and then ultimately find a p-value to make a decision. But that does bring up a question. How do you decide on the bins? The answer that you get ultimately for the p-value and then maybe your decision is dependent on the choice of bins. And in fact, the example I'm going to do, it seems to be fairly strongly dependent on the choice of bins. I was surprised at the difference in the p-values. Turns out the power of the test can also be low. Remember what power is, that's the chances of rejecting the null hypothesis when it's false. So if you want to reject the null hypothesis, you want high power. Though this time your, your hope might be different. Your hope might be to not reject the null. You hope maybe that your pet distribution that you think the data follow is a decent model. So you might hope to not reject the null. So maybe you don't care that you have low power, okay? But anyway, in the big scheme of things, this means the method is not ideal. Other methods are typically used, especially when testing for normality. There's some, a lot of graphical kind of tests you can do. What we might hope, if you try this approach, is that the statistical decision is very clear-cut, and in, hopefully clear-cut enough to not be affected too greatly by bin choices either a really tiny p-value or a really large p-value. How large is large? I don't know. It's a matter of opinion somewhat. You know, certainly if something was 0.5 or larger, I'd say that's pretty large, maybe even 0.3 or larger. How small is small? You know, 0.1 or smaller. Point, I meant to say 0.01, 1% or smaller. And what's the degrees of freedom? Well, we're going to take the simplest approach. If the number of bins is k, and if we use a fixed distribution where, where we have not estimated parameters in the distribution, then we can get away with df equals k minus 1. And that's what we will do. We will just do the simplest example. On the other hand, if you need to estimate p parameters for your distribution, for example, a normal distribution has two parameters, the mean and variance, or if you prefer, mean and standard deviation, then you have to use <coughs> df equals k minus p minus 1. You have, to, you have fewer degrees of freedom. Okay. So we'll just do the simpler case. Keep it simple. We're just trying to introduce this idea. Uh, and so let's go ahead and do that. 
And we're going to put this in the context of a spreadsheet simulation. I'm going to test a spreadsheet to see if it is producing random numbers correctly, you might say, from a standard normal distribution. Okay, now there are, again, problems with this, but let's just get the basic idea of it. We could, for example, see um, whether the spreadsheet functions equals rand and equals norm inv are working correctly. Though in reality, if you were really going to do this, you'd have to do it over and over again. It's just not, not just one test, but many, many tests. Uh, what do I mean by using equals rand and norm inv? I'll show you that in a bit here on the spreadsheet itself. Essentially, the rand function gives you a, a pseudo-random number between 0 and 1 according to a uniform distribution. And when you plug that into norm inv, that's essentially plugging it into the inverse capital F cumulative distribution function of the standard normal distribution, if I use the right mean of standard deviation, and therefore give us essentially a random number generated from a standard normal distribution. Again, I'll show you what I mean when we look at the spreadsheet. For example, we could generate a sample of size, oh, I picked 400, I could have picked 100, I could have picked 1,000, you know, I just decided to pick 400 here. Uh, from a standard normal distribution, in fact, here's the syntax. Uh, so again, rand is going to pick a random number between 0 and 1 according to a uniform distribution. Uh, plugging it into norm in with a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1, is then going to give you the corresponding random number generated from a normal distribution, again with mean zero and standard deviation of one. We're doing that 400 times. So what are we testing? We're testing the null hypothesis, essentially that the distribution is normal with mean of zero and standard, de uh, standard deviation of one and variance of one squared, which is one as well. I put the one squared in there to emphasize that with my students, we've typically been putting the variance in here. And the alternative hypothesis is that it's not. Okay, so again, I'm picking particular mean and a particular standard deviation and variance. Um, if we were, again, estimating those things based on the actual sample, sample data, that would affect the degrees of freedom. Okay, but I'm picking those specific numbers. So our degrees of freedom will be a little easier, just k minus 1 based on k bins. Based on a given set of bins, we can find the observed count in, of the generated data in each bin. And the number of parameters in this case is m equals, uh, I meant to use p here p equals 2, um, but again, I'm mentioning that, but we're not going to use it, okay? Our degrees of freedom, if we're estimating the mean of standard deviation, would then be uh, k minus 3, really, but we will not use that here, so we will use degrees of freedom equal to k minus 1. Based on the standard normal distribution, we can find the probability of an observation in each bin and then use these to find the expected counts. So we're going to find, it's sort of analogous to a discrete distribution where p1 through pk represent the probabilities of the multinomial random variable taking on each possible value. See lecture 24 to see what I mean there. Um, and we're going to use those probabilities to figure out expected counts. From there, we can compute the chi-square statistic just like usual and find the p-value. All right, so here's the first time I tried this. I used the following 10 bins. Here I'm just labeling them B1 through B10. That's not a real big deal because I, I didn't actually put the notation in these symbols here. I'm using intervals. The bins are intervals of numbers. And they seem like reasonable things to pick, though the reasonable numbers on the number line, though the probabilities, if I'm really sampling from a standard normal distribution of being in each bin, is not the same. I picked just reasonable numbers. You know, I picked negative infinity to negative 2 for my first bin. So any number less than negative 2 would go in that bin. Negative 2 to negative 1.5 for the second. Notice I'm using a square bracket for the left endpoint and a parentheses for the right. I could have done it the other way around. This means include the left endpoint. This means do not include the right endpoint. Again, I could have chosen it the other way around. It really doesn't matter with continuous distribution anyway because your likelihood of being exactly equal to something is technically zero Practically, in terms of simulation, you could get exactly two, for example, but uh, it's unlikely to happen. You know, you could get exactly two because of rounding. Negative 1.5 to negative 1, negative 1 to negative 0.5, negative 0.5 to 0. Then for the positive number, 0 to 0 0.5, 0.5 to 1, 1 to 1 1.5, 1 1.5 to 2, and then 2 to infinity. <clears throat> so just 10 reasonable looking bins to pick. But again, because the standard normal, normal distribution is not uniform, 
you know, ignoring the extreme bins, the probabilities are not the same of being in each bin. Here are the corresponding pro approximate probabilities of being in each bin. You'd need to use a calculator or a spreadsheet to figure these things out. The probability of being in this first bin is 0 0.022750. The probability of being in the second bin, negative 2 to negative 1.5, is, negative, is 0 0.044057, etc. You may want to check a few of these. For the positive ones, uh, it's symmetric. So for example, P5 you can see is the same as P6. The probability of uh, being in between negative 0.5 and 0 is the same as the probability of being between 0 and 0 0.5. P4 is the same as P7, P3 is the same as P8, P2 is the same as P9, and P1 is the same as P10. And then I can use these to find the expected counts based on a sample of size n equals 400 is what I picked. So multiply each of these numbers by 400 and here would be the expected counts you would get. You would get. You may want to pause the video and double check a few of these. They're not all the same because the probabilities are not all the same. They're not even approximately the same. According to some guidance in our textbook, you do want your sample size to be large enough that no more than 20% of these numbers are less than 5 and none are less than 1. And that is the case. None of these are even less than 5. You know, But if you used a sample size smaller, uh, then, for example, if n were 100, a couple of these would be less than 5. Um, yeah, even more more than a couple. So you do need to think about the sample size in that kind of situation. And that, in a sense, is a benefit of using bins that have equal probabilities, which will be my second attempt. Here are the results. Okay, so I'm going to show you the results. I'm not going to show you the spreadsheet quite yet. I will come to that more near the end here. A one trial. Okay, so I ran the spreadsheet simulation using the, uh, the norm, inv, and the rand. And for each bin, I got these observed counts. And again, these expected counts are computed using the theoretical probabilities. These numbers were on the previous slide. Then you compute your chi-square statistic by first computing these fractions for each i, i equals 1 through 10. Compute oi, which is the observed value, minus ei, which is the expected value, quantity squared, divided by ei. These are the numbers you get. Add those numbers up, you get the chi-square statistic to be about 7.69. How many degrees of freedom? There's k equals 10 bins here, so k minus 1 is 9. There's 9 degrees of freedom. Again, we can do this when we are using a fixed distribution. We're talking about the normal distribution with mean of 0 and standard deviation of 1. I'm not estimating the mean and standard deviation from the data. Then we'd have to use 7 degrees of freedom in that situation. Here is the p-value. The probability that a chi-squared random variable with 9 degrees of freedom is bigger than or equal to this is about 0.5656, sufficiently large that I feel comfortable saying we're not going to reject the null. This, These data is not statistically significant. It's not inconsistent with the null hypothesis that we are drawing from a normal distribution with a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1. Okay. Again, we do not have statistically evi significant evidence against the null. So maybe, you know, if we're if we're the one programming the spreadsheet, we're happy, right? We want it to work. So we're happy that we did not reject the null. Or maybe if it's a competitor's spreadsheet, we're not so happy because we want to reject the null for the competitor. In reality, you would want to do this many, many times. Okay, just one run like this is not really enough. Okay, in a sense, because you know, you think about the meaning of p-values, it's possible that you could get a p-value less, that's small, 0 0.05. In fact, 5% of the time you might do this, you could get a p-value like that. And that's something I'm going to emphasize at the end with Mathematica. And there's also just the fact that we're only testing the mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1. What about other means and standard deviations? This is not really a full test of these spreadsheet functions. Just giving you a glimmer of possibilities here. The second time I tried it, I used eight bins, uh, excuse me, this was a 10 typo here, 10 bins of an approximately equal probability of 1 tenth, 0 0.1, call them B1 through B10. Okay, so um, now I'm changing my perspective. I want my bins to have equal probability, and that would mean I could probably get away with a smaller sample size, but I'm going to use N equals 400 again anyway. Here are bins that have probability equal to approximately 0.1 each. 
negative infinity to negative 1.28, negative 1.28 to negative 0.84, etc. You can see these numbers here, and again, you have symmetry about zero because of the symmetry in the standard normal distribution about zero. Here are the corresponding approximate probabilities. They're not all the same. They're all just approximately the same. They're all close to 0.1. Here's what they are. Once again, notice we have the symmetry. For example, P5 equals P6, okay, because of the symmetry of this interval with this interval. And here are the corresponding expected bin counts. You can, again, pause the video and double check maybe one or two of these. And then what are the final results? These are the final results from the, for the same data, by the way, I should mention, I should emphasize. This is the exact same data run, okay? Exact same run with the norm in Van the Rand. Here are the observed counts, all fairly close to 40. Here are the corresponding expected counts, all pretty close to 40, not exactly 40 because, again, the, the PIs aren't exactly 0.1. Here are the corresponding observed minus expected squareds divided by expecteds. Add those up, you get a chi-square statistic that's smaller than the previous one with the bins that were not equal probability. It is different. That should make sense that it should be different. You use different bins, you're gonna get, you are going to get something different. It's not as extreme. The p-value is not going to be as small. In fact, the p-value is really large here, bigger than 0.9, based on 9 degrees of freedom. Definitely do not have statistically significant evidence against the null here. So different p-values, in fact, you might say significantly different, pun intended. You know, 0.5 something versus 0.9 something is pretty far different. So this seems untrustworthy maybe because of that. But I will tell you that some people do this, and again, maybe for a particular run of data, when you get something extreme like this, you feel pretty confident that, yeah, I'm, I'm comfortable using this null hypothesis here, okay? If you have, especially if you have other reasons to believe that the null hypothesis is true. In reality, again, you'd want to do many such tests. Okay, so in the end here, we're almost done. I'm going to uh, show you the spreadsheet and also show you some Mathematica. <clears throat> if you don't know Mathematica, don't worry about it. Uh, it might be worth seeing what I do just to emphasize the conceptual point here. I don't want to show you everything, every detail about the spreadsheet here, though I do have my two runs of these two different tests at the, across the top. And as usual, the uh, course documents you'll find in, a link in the description below. Um, this was the column where I used this syntax here. Uh, equals norm inv. It put a decimal in there because I was just using an autocomplete. You don't actually have to put the, the point in there with the norm inv. I don't know if you, how well you can see that here. Uh, rand in the first entry, comma, zero, comma, one. The rand again picks number a number be between zero and one with according to a uniform distribution, essentially with equal probability for each small interval. And then the zero is the mean and the one is the standard deviation. Um, each time you run this, you get different numbers. I copied and pasted my one run that I did the test in into column B with by doing a, uh, a paste special, paste values. If you just do a copy and paste without doing that, it copies and pastes formulas, which makes changes all the time. And if you want a fixed data set, you would have to do the paste special. And there are 400 numbers here. You can see if we go down, we go to row 400 here. There we are. And then again, this is for the first run with these bins. Something kind of tricky that you have to do, and it's not ideal because you, you can't really do copy and pasting as much as you like, is to get these observed counts, you can use count if. Um, with that kind of syntax there, I did do some copying and pasting, and so I put the dollar signs in there. It's hard, might be hard to see, especially if you're using a, a phone here, that I have dollar $B, dollar one colon, oh, I meant to put dollar $B, dollar 400 in there, comma, in quotations, less than negative two. That counts how many numbers are less than negative two. And for that particular run, there are six of them. The other ones do have dollar signs in both spots, so it's, it's okay. I did do have to do some subtractions in these other spots, like you can see of count if values to get counts between different numbers. That's kind of like subtracting different values of a cumulative distribution function, capital F. Um, so I got these observed counts. Here are the PIs that I just typed in uh, based on, uh, I used my calculator actually. Um, and then 
Here are the corresponding expected counts. Notice the formula is to do equals 400 times the corresponding PI because n is 400 here. Here are observed minus expected squareds divided by expected. That's the formula up here. If you can barely see it there. Essentially equals minus e uh, equals e2 minus g2 quantity squared divided by g2, and then copy and paste the formula downward. Add up these numbers, you get 400. Add up these numbers, you get 1. It's not quite because of rounding. Add up these numbers, and you get the chi-square statistic value. Degrees of freedom is 9. And if you now compute the p-value with equals chi-dist based on the first entry being the chi-squared value of 7.69 and the second one being the degrees of freedom, here's where you get the 0.5-something for the degrees of freedom. Same kind of thing for this other one. Ultimately, a smaller chi-square and therefore a larger p-value. Okay? And now I'm going to show you Mathematica. Um, pretty quickly here, just to emphasize that in Mathematica you can pretty do, do this thing over and over again, and you can even con, uh, emphasize the conceptual meaning of a p-value. You know, you could get a small p-value even when the null is true. That does happen if you're using a 5% standard, for example, then you're going to get a small a p-value less than 5%, 5% of the time. Okay? Um, distribution fit test will run uh, if I combine it with random variate and normal distribution in this way, this is um, computing a p-value, just like we just did, based on some test. I'm actually not sure if it uses a chi-squared distribution or not. I might have to spec specify that, but I'm not, not sure what the default is. But it's saying the p-value is 0 0.947039 for that particular run. If I enter it again, random variate will generate a new random sample from this normal distribution with will we'll generate a different p-value, that is in this case 0.53. Keep doing this. You know, once in a while you'll get a small number. And in fact, if I applied the distribution fit test to this random variate data over and over again, using the slash at and the table as i goes from 1 to 100, this is essentially 100 p-values for 100 different simulations, and notice some of them are small. And how many are smaller than 5%? This counting with the previous output, the percent means previous output, will tell us there's three of these hundred that are less than 5%. I don't know that I want to take the time to go finding them here. Maybe we can at least find one. Um, that one. Okay, here we go. There's one right there. So uh, that's going to see, if we, and if we do it again, we'll probably get another number close to 5 there's another run, and hopefully again we get another number relatively close to five. Okay, so even with uh, when your null hypothesis is true, you can still sometimes reject it, and then you're making type one error. All right, so that's it for as far as chi-square distri distributions and chi-square tests. Uh, thanks for watching.